Please be seated. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Nehemiah. We are, we are going to be done with the book of Nehemiah today. It's been uh, 13 or 14 weeks of studying through uh, the book of Nehemiah, studying through uh, chapter by chapter, learning uh, from uh, this incredible story, uh, this man who felt charged by God when he was living in captivity uh, to request uh, from the king to be able to return to his home city, to be re- able to return to the promised land, uh, to rebuild uh, a broken, torn down city. He started uh, with rebuilding the, this wall, uh, the wall around the city. He got a report by his brother that the city was a disgrace, uh, that the people around him basically thought uh, God's people were a joke because they were a city and a town with no walls. And so Nehemiah goes home, he starts to rebuild, uh, and, 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 he, and he faces some opposition from the outside. Uh, he also faces some opposition from the inside. Uh, as he then rebuilds, he also brings in some reforms. Uh, he, he helps the people to be able to take care of their own, uh, to be able to take care of God's holy temple, uh, that their worship uh, would, would be proper and, and true and good, and the way he uh, God has commanded it to be. As he uh, helps with these reforms, uh, we see a revival. We see where God's people then return to the book. They return back to uh, studying the Bible, studying the law, understanding uh, what was in the law, understanding what they need to do and how they should do it to, to honor God to the best of their abilities. And we see this revival uh, where they return back to, to God's word and they, they make some reforms saying, we will never do this again or we will always do this. Uh, one of them was, uh, we will never uh, intermarry uh, we, will, we will keep, uh, we, that way we don't worship uh, false gods, but we will only worship the one true God. Uh, one of them was that we'll take care of the temple and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give uh, in a way that would be honoring to God that the, the Levites and the musicians would be uh, cared for and the priests. They made these reforms. And then last week, or it was two weeks ago, uh, last week I wasn't here, thank you Barry for preaching, you you got me a little scared. Sunday, I was listening to your sermon, and you said uh, chapter 14, and I had to go back in my Bible and look to see if there was a 14. Uh, there's not. We're, we're done on 13, because uh, there's not a chapter 14. Uh, but we, uh, last two weeks ago, we saw where they returned to, to worship God. Uh, they rededicated uh, this temple, these walls. And, uh, and now, in the last chapter, we're going to see where Nehemiah uh, has, has returned uh, back to Babylon, has returned back home to Persia, and, uh, and, and is probably working for the king. Uh, scholars believe that he maybe could have been gone for as many as 12 years uh, based upon the time, but he, he might have been gone for 10 years or so. Uh, and we see where Nehemiah has returned back to serve the king, and then he's going to come back home. He's going to come home again uh, to God's people, and, uh, and we're going to see where Nehemiah four times prays, and he cries out to God uh, to remember a something about him or something about his people. How, how do you want to be remembered? How would you like uh, you personally to be remembered as I think about uh, the way we remember people, uh, we usually remember people for specific actions. I'm going to throw out some famous people, and I want you to call back on how they are remembered. Uh, Albert Einstein. How is Albert Einstein remembered? As a genius, as a scientist. Uh, Tiger Woods. Golfer. That's an easy one. Uh, William Shakespeare poet or a writer, uh, Billy Graham, evangelist, Abraham Lincoln, president, yep, Say, a fourth grader got that one, that's good, <laughs> a fifth grader, <laughs> uh, Michael Jordan, good, I didn't, nod for baseball, <laughs> uh, the GOAT, the greatest of all time besides my favorite basketball player, which is not Michael Jordan. Uh, but we remember these people 
for, for their specific actions, for something they were good at, for something that they did. Uh, and Nehemiah here in chapter 13 is going to ask God to remember some specific things about him. I've asked David to come read Nehemiah 13 for us. There is, uh, there's not a whole bunch of names. Uh, just a couple. There's some. And, uh, but, but turn with David to chapter 13, and he's going to tackle it for us. Good morning. Nehemiah chapter 13. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. And there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Before this, Elijah, the priest, had, put in charge, had been put in charge of the storehouses of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and the temple articles and also the ties of grain, new wine, new wine and oil prescribed for the Levites, singers and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil things Elijah had done providing Tobiah room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the legs, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and singers responsible for the service had gone back into their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their post. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah, the priest, Zadok, the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, the assistant, because these men were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their brothers. Remember me for this, O oh my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. In those days I saw men in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them against selling food on that day. Men from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish of all kinds, and all kinds of merchandise, and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing? desecrating the Sabbath day. Didn't your forefathers do the same thing so that our God brought all this calamity upon us and upon the city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When the evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened up until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me for this also, O oh my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. 
Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, or the language of one of the other peoples, and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are doing all this wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Joah, son of Elijah, the high priest was the son-in-law to Samuel at the Hornite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties, each to his own task. I also made provision for contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favor, oh my God. As I said, four times we see where Nehemiah calls out, remember me. Uh, and, and in this passage, we actually see three very distinct scenes uh, we see three very, uh, very quick uh, pictures uh, in, in this passage. The first picture, uh, the first scene is, is from verses 1 through 13. And in verses 1 through 13, uh, we see where the people have forgotten worship. Uh, they've forgotten uh, the worship that they were called to do. Uh, we see in, uh, cha- in verse 1 of 13... Uh, they're reading from the book of the law. Uh, they're, they're, they're still uh, hearing God's word. Uh, they're gathered in the assembly together. And, and, and then we see a shift in verse 4. Uh, we see where Eliashib the priest, uh, who had been in charge of the storerooms, uh, where people would bring uh, the grain, would bring uh, certain oils and, uh, and, and, and food for the priests as, as worship, uh, they, we see where this priest has allowed someone to come live in the storeroom. This person is Tobiah. Uh, he, he allows, the priest allows uh, one of the arch enemies of Nehemiah uh, from chapters back, one of the ones from the outside uh, that was trying to stop the building of the wall, uh, who was trying to uh, stop uh, the people from having a city of their own. Uh, we see where Eliashib the priest uh, has allowed Tobiah uh, a room uh, that was for Formerly used to store the offering uh, and grain and incense and the temple articles. The people very quickly forgot the worship that they were called to do. We see as we uh, go on further, uh, Nehemiah says it was uh, 12 years later that he, uh, that he hears about this, uh, that he's now back, 12 years have passed. Uh, he gum- comes back to the city. Uh, he comes back from uh, Artaxerxes from Babylon and uh, gets permission. Uh, Nehemiah stands pretty bold uh, to ask to go back again, uh, but he goes back because he's heard that, that the people aren't worshiping the way that they were called to. You remember that they even declared that they were going to worship God and God alone, that they were going to take care of his house and his people. 
And we see uh, where Nehemiah hears Eliashib, what he's done, uh, and that he gave uh, Tobiah this room in the court. Uh, It says he was displeased. Uh, It says it actually says in in my Bible in verse eight that he was greatly displeased. Not only uh, has Nehemiah heard that the people aren't worshiping the way that they're supposed to, that they weren't committed uh, to bringing their their offering and their grain uh, in the way that they were called to, uh, but he's probably also greatly displeased because this man is an outsider. This man is not only an outsider, uh, this man is the one of the men that tried to stop the rebuilding of the wall. There's, there's an issue here. So he's greatly displeased. Uh, and we see that he takes, uh, he, he takes Tobiah's household goods uh, and he throws it out. Uh, I don't think that this was Nehemiah uh, being, being really nice, like, okay, let's pack your stuff up. Uh, here, let's, it's time for you to go. Uh, Nehemiah uh, is enraged. He is, he's mad. It almost gives us this picture of, of Jesus in Mark chapter 11. Jesus returns uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, he's, he's getting close to the time where he's going to die uh, on the cross Uh, for our sins, for the people's sins. And he walks into the temple courts uh, and he sees uh, that the the temple, the place of worship, has been turned into a place of merchants. Uh, He even calls it a den of robbers and thieves. And so these merchants uh, here in Mark uh, have turned the temple courts into a place where they're buying and selling and ripping off people. And Jesus uh, comes in and he overturns the tables. Uh, This is... This is done with great power. Uh, in, in our men's group, we talk about Jesus, the lion and the lamb. Uh, and a lot of times we get this picture of Jesus of being uh, just this soft lamb, uh, this man who was perfect, which he was, uh, sinless and just soft. Especially if you look at like the pictures of Jesus we have, we see this picture of like this really soft blue-eyed guy. He's a, he's a lion here. He comes into the temple courts, he overturns the tables, Uh, he fashions a whip, and he drives them out. That's a little bit of what I think Nehemiah does here. Nehemiah drives out Tobiah, says, get out of here, throws his stuff out, and then in verse 9, he gives orders to purify the room. He gives orders uh, to bring back the purity of the room. This was the place where uh, where the offerings, the grain offerings and the incense were going to be stored. Uh, He purifies the room and it says that then he put back the equipment of the house of God with the grain offering and the incense. That's verse 9. Nehemiah, uh, as, as an enraged man, Uh, throws him out, and then he returns to the way it's supposed to be. He returns uh, this part of the temple uh, to the way that it's supposed to be. He returns it to to where worship uh, and where these offerings could be stored uh, in a proper way. And then he learns in verses 10 through 13 that the people haven't been caring for the Levites and for the musicians in the proper way. Uh, he learns that the Levites, uh, who were supposed to be provided for, uh, their needs were supposed to be taken care of. Uh, and this was, uh, this was a part of the people's worship, uh, were taking care of the Levites. Uh, and, and, and he learns that they, they haven't been cared for. And that they have actually had to go out uh, and leave uh, where, where they were established to live. They had to go out from the temple to, to go to the outskirts of the city, uh, back to their, their family's land, uh, to farm, to provide for their own needs. So the people very quickly forgot. They very quickly didn't care for they very quickly fell away and forgot the worship that they were supposed to have for God. Nehemiah then uh, helps the people uh, to to bring their tithes of grain and new wine and olive oil into the storerooms, uh, and and he places uh, the right people uh, in charge of it again. Uh, He he then... uh, 
he makes them responsible for the supplies of the fellow Levites. Nehemiah doesn't just leave the people, doesn't just drive out to buy it, doesn't just say, you guys are supposed to do this, but he steps in and says, this is how we're supposed to worship God. This is how our worship is supposed to be forgotten worship by the people. Nehemiah in verse 14, we have the first, remember me. He says, remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of the Lord and for his servants. So Nehemiah's first remember me prayer, uh, he, he says, remember me, God. Remember the stuff that I've faithfully done for you, that I've faithfully done for your house, that the people would be able to worship properly in the way that you have called them. The second scene that we see are the forgotten commands. The second scene goes from verses 15 uh, down to verse 22. And we see where the people have forgotten the commands of God they said they were going to follow. Uh, They, in verse 15, it says uh, that Nehemiah uh, sees uh, the people of Judah treading uh, the wine press on the Sabbath and bringing grain and loading their donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and other kinds of loads. Uh, they were bringing them all into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So Nehemiah, as he comes back to the city, he now sees the people uh, working. He sees that the, the city is, is working a little bit, uh, which is probably... It probably makes them a little happy, probably makes them a little encouraged, like, okay, the people are providing for themselves, they're farming, uh, things are going on on the outsides of the city, uh, and, and then it comes to the Sabbath day, which would have been uh, our Saturday, and he sees the people out working. He sees them loading up uh, all their different kinds of wares that they're growing, uh, and, and he remembers and reminds them that you said you were going to keep the Sabbath day holy, that you, uh, that you were going to honor the Sabbath day. <clears throat> and, and Nehemiah, uh, he warns them. He warns them, and he, he, he warns them about selling their food on the Sabbath, and he, he even tells them, uh, don't you remember, this is, this is why we got ourselves in this mess in the first place. Uh, the, the, the whole reason why we we are, were in captivity and had to rebuild the city was because we weren't honoring the commands of God. Uh, we weren't honoring the Sabbath as we were called to do, and he's, he sees them buying and selling. He even in verse uh, 19, uh, he sees uh, that uh, as evening falls, uh, he sees uh, the, the people coming uh, into Jerusalem, trying to come into the gates uh, to, to do their buying and selling. And uh, Nehemiah doesn't just uh, stop them, but he locks the gates. He orders the gates to be locked, and he even places his own men uh, on, uh, the, like, in charge of the, the walls and in charge of the gates. Don't open them, he tells his men. Don't open these gates, uh, not on the Sabbath day. This is not what we're supposed to do. Uh, but he warns them. Uh, the people, these merchants, they then spend the night. They spend the night on uh, the outsides of the wall uh, because they can't get in because Nehemiah's uh, men are listening. Uh, and, and Nehemiah tells them, uh, if, if you keep doing this, uh, if you keep uh, trying to come in on the Sabbath, uh, David's, uh, David says, I-, I will lay hands on you, which I, I liked. I liked that, that, that translation. That's the older NIV. Uh, in the newer NIV, it says that I'll have you arrested. But Nehemiah's like, no, we're, we're not going to disobey the Sabbath anymore. Uh, God's people are not going to do this. They are not going to forget the commands. And if you do, I will lay hands on you. I, I will personally keep you out of the city. What's the big deal, though? The Sabbath. Uh, it makes us first think, uh, well, am I supposed to keep the Sabbath? Uh, am I not supposed to ever do any work on a Saturday or a Sunday or whatever day it might be? Uh, and, and I want to remind us that we aren't commanded in the same way God's people were commanded to keep a Sabbath. 
The Sabbath for us, uh, we, we should keep a Sabbath. We should have a day of rest. But we're not commanded uh, in the New Testament in the same way uh, to, to keep the Sabbath. But God's people were. God, I, when he created in Genesis, he took six days to create and he gave an example of resting on the seventh. He gave an example that, that it's good for men to rest. And he commanded his people to do so. Uh, not only does he just command them to do so because it's rest, but the resting on the Sabbath and taking one day for his people made his people different. It made his people a light uh, to the communities around him. As we see uh, in verses 19 uh, through 20 or 21, uh, we see people from the outside coming in. We see people from the outside uh, treating uh, Jerusalem and treating God's people just the same way as they would any other place. And God's people are supposed to be a light to the nations. It reminds me of Jesus when he's teaching in, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. It says, you are the light of the earth, but, but if... Sorry, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot. You are the light of the world, but a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone that is in the house." In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. God's people, he was given these, he gave them certain commands that they would be different than the other nations. That they, that they would look different, that they would be a light. It's a great reminder for us uh, that we, uh, as the church and as God's people, are called to be different we're called uh, to be a light, to, to put our, our, our light on a, on a hill or on a stand uh, that it would give light to everything that is in the house. We're called to look different. We're called to light the world. That, not that, that we would look good, but that the people around us would see our good deeds and they would honor and glorify our Father in heaven. Nehemiah here sees God's people. He sees the commands that they have forgotten. He sees that they're not honoring the Sabbath, and he sees that they look like every other nation. The third scene we see is this forgotten purity. To finish, uh, sorry, I forgot to remember here, uh, Nehemiah, as he sees the people uh, not honoring the Sabbath, uh, he cries out to God, remember me for this also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. So Nehemiah here, as he sees uh, God's people forgetting the Sabbath, this forgotten command, he, he says, for me, God, show mercy to me. Uh, withhold uh, the punishment that I deserve as a sinful person and have mercy on me because of your love for me. That just reminds me of how merciful God is to us, how, how he withholds the punishment that we so richly deserve. Uh, we, we deserve punishment and wrath, but, but God steps in, and Jesus stepped in, and he, he took the punishment for us. He came to earth 2,000 years ago, and he died on the cross for our sins uh, that, that all we would have to do uh, is to confess our sins, and he, he forgives us. He gives us mercy instead of the punishment we deserve. They had forgotten commands. And then the third scene is this forgotten purity, uh, this forgotten purity. And this has to do with, uh, with marriage. Uh, it says, uh, he saw the men of Judah uh, this is in verse 23. He saw the men of Judah uh, who had married men, uh, women uh, from Ashdod, from Ammon, and from Moab. Uh, it, it, and, and this is a problem not because, uh, because of the race, uh, but this is a problem because what happens when you marry somebody that worships differently than you uh, is you so quickly start to worship 
the way they do. Uh, the things that are important to them uh, become more important to you. And God says, you know, you know what? We're not supposed to have any, any idols. Uh, there should be no other gods before me. And if you marry people from the outside that worship other gods, uh, you will so quickly worship other gods too. He says that he sees these men uh, that have married uh, these ladies from different uh, cultures that are worshiping different gods. Uh, and, and it says half the children uh, spoke the language of Ashdod and, and the other half spoke uh, the language of other peoples. But they didn't know how to speak the language of Judah. This is, this is actually really important. It sounds like it sounds like a kind of a weird side note. Who cares what language they speak? What does that really matter? Uh, this understanding and knowing uh, the language of Judah was how they were going to be able to keep the law. It was how they were going to know what God had commanded them to do and be able to follow it. It wasn't just a problem of, uh, of communication, uh, but it was a problem of knowing and understanding the law. We have uh, a culture now here uh, and young people here that are going to grow up not being able to read God's word, not being able to hear God's word taught, uh, which means they aren't going to follow it. And then if we, if we throw in other cultures uh, and other idol worship, they will so quickly worship other gods. In verse 25, we see, uh, I rebuke them. It says, I called curses down on them. I beat some of their men and pulled out their hair. Uh, now, I'm not going to say what Nehemiah did here was right. Uh, we, we see where uh, Nehemiah is full of passion. We see where uh, he overturns the tables. I have no problems with that. I'm not going to say that Nehemiah didn't act uh, inappropriately here, uh, but he acted with great passion. I can almost see a Nehemiah grabbing one of them and saying, How dare you! Stop it! And ripping their hair out. Now, like I said, I'm not saying that's the right thing. He says, then he made them take oaths in the name of God that they would not give their daughters in marriage uh, to their sons, nor take their daughter in marriage for their, their own sons. Nehemiah is enraged. Uh, he's, he's more than upset over what's going on here because he knows what God had commanded them to do. And he knows what will happen generation after generation if the people decide to worship false gods. Uh, they, he knows that they will very quickly forget the purity that they are supposed to have. Nehemiah, uh, he then reminds them. Uh, we see this reminder of what happened to King Solomon. Uh, King Solomon uh, w was, was the wisest man because he... Because he asked God for it. God, God said, you, whatever you want. And he asked for wisdom. Uh, and then God blessed him uh, with riches and power. Uh, but, but Solomon had a fatal flaw. Solomon uh, brought women from other cultures, uh, women from other nations uh, into his courts, uh, wives and concubines. Uh, and, and by doing so, uh, it led, it says here in verse 26, that it led him, him into sin. It led them uh, to, to sin with these foreign women. Very quickly, the, the, the wisest, richest, most powerful man forgot the purity that God had called him to, and it brought him into sin. In verse 28, uh, we see that uh, one of uh, the sons of a high priest married into uh, Sanballat the Horonite's family. Uh, it's just a side note. We have another one of, uh, it's the other one of Nehemiah's arch enemies. Uh, we had Tobiah and Sanballat who were trying to stop the temple or the, or the walls from being rebuilt. Uh, so just as a side note, uh, I'm sure that, that this uh, helped in some of Nehemiah's anger towards the people, uh, that now you would even intermarry so much that you would bring in Sanballat's family uh, to our people. Nehemiah cries out, Remember them, my God. 
He doesn't say, remember me here. Uh, he, he doesn't say re, the, other t- the other two prayers before this. He says, remember me, God. Remember the things that I've done. Uh, but here he says, remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Nehemiah, I think this prayer was offered uh, within his rage. Uh, maybe even uh, while he w- had someone's hair in his hands uh, or he was throwing somebody out, uh, he says, remember them. He's, he's upset. He's like, God, give them what they deserve. Remember what they've done. Remember what they've done and bring judgment on them because they've defiled the priestly office. Uh, they've, they've, they've taken uh, the, the office that was supposed to bring the people to worship, uh, that was supposed to cover uh, the people's sins, and they've defiled it. They've, they've made a mockery of God. And he says, remember them for their sins and don't let their sin go unpunished. Here we see... Uh, Nehemiah, uh, and these three scenes, we see that they have forgotten the commands. They've forgotten the worship, and they've forgotten the purity that God has called him to. Nehemiah, now we see the, the close of the book. Uh, we see the very end here. Uh, Nehemiah could have maybe left at that point, could have said, I'm done. I'm done with these people. Uh, they've forgotten everything that, that we have done together, everything that I have done, everything, God, that you have commanded uh, them to do. But Nehemiah finishes with some final actions. And his final actions found in verse 30. It says, so I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign, I assigned them duties, each his own task. I also made provisions for the contributions of wood that at designated time and for the first fruits. Nehemiah, uh, I think I would have been very tempted to say, you know what, I'm done. I think probably most of us would have said, I'm done, I'm moving away, I'm moving back to the palace. I'm going to go hang out with uh, Artaxerxes in Babylon and eat his good food. I'm done with these people. Uh, But Nehemiah doesn't stop there. Nehemiah, he's, he, makes, he makes provisions for him. He says that he purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign. He takes care of God's house. He takes care of God's people. He takes care of the priests. Uh, he, he gets rid of uh, the foreign uh, idol worship. Uh, he's gotten rid of Tobiah's uh, stuff out of his house. Uh, and he makes the temple a place that can be worshipped again. He then assigns them duties. He takes the priests and Levites and he reminds them, remember, this is what we're supposed to do. This is, this is how we're going to take care of God's house. He then also reminds them uh, and he makes provisions for the, for the wood uh, and, and for the first fruits. This wood was uh, the wood that would burn on, on the altar that would keep burning, uh, never going out. And then the first fruits that, that, that everything that we have, we would take the first chunk off and give it to God. Uh, and he makes provisions for these things. Uh, he sets it back up. He sets the people up for success. And then he has, gives his last, remember me. He says, remember me with favor, my God. I'm sure Nehemiah, as he, as he closes this book, he, as he closes uh, this time and as we close the book here, uh, I'm sure Nehemiah is feeling rejected. I'm sure he's feeling a little bit like a failure. I'm sure he's feeling like, man, I don't know. I don't know if these people are going to be able to do it. Uh, and, he, and he cries out to God, remember me with favor, my God. And he finishes the book with that. Nehemiah's final actions is he takes care of the people. Uh, and, and it reminds me of, of John 14. And in John 14, uh, we see where Jesus says over and over and over, I think it's like four or five times, if you love me, you will keep my commands. He says, if you love me, you'll do what I've asked you to do. And I think that's a little bit of uh, what Nehemiah is, is finishing up here uh, God, I love you. I just want to do what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I'm going to set the people up uh, to be able to obey your commands. 
to be able to obey and take care of uh, your people, to be able to obey and take care of your temple. Uh, And it's a good reminder for us. If we truly love God, we're going to do the things that God has commanded us to do. Nehemiah finishes with, remember me with favor, God. Throughout the book of Nehemiah, we've seen where Nehemiah recognizes that there's a problem. Chapter 1. Chapter 1, Nehemiah sees uh, and hears about an issue. Uh, He recognizes the problem. He sees that God's people were in disgrace and were in trouble. Uh, He calls out to God, God, what do you want me to do? He makes big requests to the king. He requests big of Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes grants his request. Nehemiah takes a big step. He could have been, he probably could have been uh, killed right there just for requesting uh, to leave the king's presence or if the king didn't like it, but he makes big requests. He resists the opposition from around him. He resists uh, Tobiah, uh, the Ammonite, and, uh, and, and uh, sorry, Sam Ballot, the Horonite, uh, when, when there's trouble from the outside. He, he also provides when there's trouble from the inside and he, the people are hungry and they're losing and they, they're, they're losing property and they're losing their freedoms. He resists the opposition. He then rebuilds. Uh, he rebuilds the, the city uh, with the people and uh, the, the city walls. In 52 days, the job is done. The doors are hung and it's in place. Nehemiah rebuilds. Then we see a revival in the land. We saw where God's people return back to his word. They return back to, uh, to knowing and reading and studying uh, and, and following God's commands. And we see a revival in the land. We see where they, they worship him. And now we see a recommitment to keep God's laws. Nehemiah finishes it with he sets the priests up. He purifies the house. And then he finishes with, remember me, God, for what I've done. As we finish the book of Nehemiah, we've seen a man uh, that has acted in a way that was bold, that has acted in a way uh, that understood who God is, understood his commands, understood God's plan for his people, and we see where God does amazing things through Nehemiah. And I want to challenge us in the same way. Uh, when we're faithful, when we're faithful to follow what God has uh, told us to follow, when we're faithful to follow his word, when we're faithful to put together, uh, to put his word into practice, to love each other as God has called us to, to love him as he's called us to, God will do amazing things in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, we uh, thank you for Uh, This book, we thank you for the challenges uh, that it's been uh, to us. Lord, we we pray that we would be men that would act like Nehemiah. Lord, that would stand uh, for your word, uh, that would stand for your people, uh, that would stand and do something big and bold for you, God. Lord, we pray that for our church, that we would be a light to the nations around us. In Jesus' name, amen.